Hey, how's it going, Devin? Hello, all. I feel like I'm signing on just to, oh, see, oh, I was just talking about this in my, see how I spell the word hello, H-E-L-L-O-W. I was just talking to one of my other classes, how I make that mistake constantly. And uh, it's just muscle memory. And whenever I type the letter as L-O, I've got to follow it up with a W. So I have a uh, autocorrect in Word and Outlook. So it automatically fixes that for me, but there it is. Let's try it again, H-E-L-L-O, ball. Let's see, I've got my screen sharing. I've got the uh, recorder recording and I've actually got my code editor open here. I was looking at something a little bit earlier. I'm gonna close that, close that, close that. And I think I'm in pretty good shape. Um, let's see, I don't need to be in my JavaScript area. <laughs> yeah, I guess I write the word low more often than hello. So I just feel like I, that W's got to be in there. Let's see, I'm in my web dev folder. I've got a couple of different folders and files, maybe since the last time you saw me, but um, otherwise I'm still structuring things, I think in a roughly organized way. So I'm in my 195 folder and I've got a few pages in there. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new one. So let me just start a blank file and I'm gonna save this, save, save, save. And this is going into my, no, go there and then into my 195 folder. And I'm gonna call this, um, Now let's see, how about um, stylesheets1.html. So I'm making a web page called stylesheets1.html. This is actually our official topic for this week, CSS, even though we've already been doing some CSS. So we'll definitely be uh, focusing a lot more on it. I'm gonna show you a few new things with style sheets. <laughs> and my intention here is to actually end up with a few files, three files. We're gonna have a web page file which is what I've got a blank one started up here. And then we're gonna have two style sheet files. I'll explain a little bit more in that bit in just a moment. So what I'm gonna do first is zoom in a shade. I don't wanna zoom, in. do I wanna zoom in that much? Um, yeah, good enough. And let me go ahead and start off. A little bit of this. A little bit of that. I think that is what we call good enough. And then I'm gonna have a section here where I'm gonna have my external styles. Sheets. So with external style sheets, I'm gonna go ahead and create the links for my external style sheets, even though I haven't created my external style sheets. So this is where if I had them, actually, yeah, this is where if I was using Google fonts, I'm not gonna use Google fonts again today. But um, if I was using Google Fonts, this is where I would have those links that I get from the Google Fonts website. I'd put those in there. <laughs> Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a link tag. This is how I link my external style sheet to my web page. I'm gonna link relation equals style sheet, href equals, I'm gonna go into my styles folder slash, and I'm gonna connect a style sheet file, which I have not created yet. And that style sheet file, when I do create it, is gonna be called um, reset.css. I'll explain why I'm calling it that in just a moment. So I'm gonna have a reset styles. And then 
I'm going to create another one. And this one is going to be called page elements. Kind of thinking of this on the fly. Um, yeah. And then I suppose, uh, do I even want to show you internal styles? I don't want to show you internal styles. Um, so we've been using internal styles a number of times already. And I don't think I'm going to do internal styles. Internal styles are nice, but I really do want to push using external styles um, this week. So everything we do is going to be on an external style sheet. So however far you've gotten into your web page for today, obviously I'm cool if you opened up a page that you created before and are starting some, or, um, and are just kind of adapting it. Don't forget, file, save as, give it a new file name. However, I do want you to do this and go ahead and prepare to connect to style sheets. Again, I haven't made these style sheet files yet. I'm gonna do that momentarily, um, but yeah, that's pretty good. And of course, if I was using any uh, Google fonts, they would be somewhere in here. Yeah. Now I feel like using some Google fonts. I'm gonna see how fast I can find just one. I'll just get one Google font. Um, so let me just jump out to my browser, new tab, close, 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 closing a bunch of stuff. And close, there, get cleaned up, get a little more organized. New tab, Google Fonts. That's not what I want. Google Fonts. There we go, fonts.google.com. And I'm just going to, ooh, what if I just hit my space bar to page down a bunch? Let's see what I can find that just kind of jumps out at me. Able looks pretty cool. Actually, Source Serif Pro, that's the one I like. I'm going to go for that one. I'm going to click on this one, and I'm going to use number 400, regular. I'm going to select that style. I'm going to grab the link tags that they provide. I'm going to copy this, head back over to my code, and then paste. Now, it looks pretty messy in there, so let me go ahead and uh, indent so things look a little bit more together. And uh, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Now you notice, let's kind of ignore, don't worry about the uh, lines 11 and 12, but I'm looking at their line 13. They've got the href attribute first, and then they have the REL or relationship attribute second. That is perfectly okay. It, the order of attributes within a tag does not matter. So no problem that they put them in that particular order. It's been my habit to do the relationship first, but it works just as well if we do the href first. I'm gonna swap mine out just so they look a little bit more consistent there, but it's the same basic thing. So I'm loading in and basically we're just connecting with their Google API. API is a program that helps connect a website database to uh, another, to a web page basically. So, and I'm just getting this, Google fonts provided them, and then I'm gonna load up that font. Now, when I do use that font, I'm gonna need this little font family down here as an example, Source Serif Pro. I'm not gonna mess with that at the moment, but I'm gonna keep this page available. So when I do apply a font, I remember to jump in there. What if you're not using a Google font today? Well, it just means you're not as cool as me, but it's not gonna hurt you for this web page. So you, do ne you never have to use Google fonts on your web pages. However, if you wanna do something a little bit different than the standard Verdana, Tahoma, Arial, that kind of stuff, then this is probably the best way to go, best and easiest way to go. So I've got a bunch of link tags here. So let's get to it. Now, before, actually, before I get to it, I, I, um, I have already made a mistake on my web page. So I have, you know, how, how the class has been going for 10 minutes, and I've made a pretty critical mistake in my web page structure. So go ahead and in your text and in the chat window, Tell me what my mistake is. It is obvious from the screen I'm sharing right now. You got it. 
I left out the head section. So after the H, opening HTML tag, I should have, and I'm gonna tab it over here. I should have an opening head tag. And of course then, uh, control Z. And then of course my closing head tag would be down here, paste. And then after the closing head, I'd have my body tags. So yes, I left out the head section. And of course, what tipped me off to that was I went to go do the body section and I'm like, wait, the, the starting body tag is always after the closing head tag. And I was like, oh, so clearly I left something out. So let's make sure we've got that clear at the top. I've got my doc type definition. I've got my um, HTML tag with language attribute. I've got my head section with the meta character encoding. Then I've got a title for my page. I've got a few standard meta tags in there. And then I've got several links to external style sheets. Three of these I just got from Google fonts. They provided those. Two of them are really what we're focusing on today. I'm linking two CSS files, which I have not created yet. I'll be doing that momentarily. Closing head section, opening body tag, closing body tag, closing HTML. That is my latest and greatest blank web page template. So if you're making a, a new page, then you might even do a file save as, save this as blank page template.html. And then do another file save as and call it, you know, style sheets one or whatever you're calling your file today. So basically, this is a pretty good starting position for a lot of web pages that you might make, especially if you've already found a font that you like to use regularly and stuff. Cool. Now, in the body of the page, I'm going to go ahead and do a couple things. Let's see, I'm going to create a header section. Within this header section, I'm going to create two divs that are blank. The div, which I don't believe you've seen me do in class yet. I've done this in videos, but I haven't done it in class, which is a little bit unusual. Normally a div is one of the first block elements I'll demonstrate, but um, I'm going back to it today. So a div is a generic block element. You use a div when you're not sure what else to use. For instance, Header is a block element, but I know what the header's purpose is. Paragraph is a block element, but I know what a paragraph's purpose is. H1 or headline one is a block element, but I know what that purpose is. When I wanna have a significant block on my page, but I don't really know how to define it or what its real purpose is gonna be, I go for the generic div. It stands for logical division. I will never ask you that in a quiz, but um, it, is a, it is a very common block element. If you were to look at 100 professional websites, all 100 would have examples of the div element being used. Like other block elements, div, header, nav, um, h1, it doesn't have default styling. You have to style it with your CSS. So it's really no different working with a div as it is working with a section tag or heading tag or article tag. But a div, like I said, when you don't know what to use, Use the div. Okay, so the reason I'm doing this, I don't want to you know, lead you in too much, but I'm kind of, today I'm going to do something a little bit screwy where I'm kind of going to be demonstrating some skills from participation 3A due tonight and participation 3B due Thursday night. So I have no doubt that I'm going to be demonstrating everything you need for participation 3A. So if you follow along with me, that's going to be a no brainer because I'm only asking you to create three rules with like three declarations each. That's going to be a cakewalk. In fact, most of you have already done this and other pages you've made. So that's, a, that's guaranteed. We're definitely going to accomplish that one. For Thursday's class, I meant to demonstrate how to create this little section of layout, which I found a while back on a website and I like it. And it's a good use of CSS and blocks and stuff. And I'm really not liking my, web dev homepage. I think it's just kind of lame looking. So I wanted to jazz it up a bit. And there's a good chance that the page I make today for myself is going to end up being my index homepage very, very soon. And I thought this is kind of nice. I like the idea of displaying a photo, something kind of outdoorsy and interesting. And then having this block over here slightly overlap that photo with my page title right in here and stuff like that. So um, 
probably won't hit all of these features today, but definitely I'd like to get these block layouts and the start of the text in there. So that's why I have two divs. One div is going to represent this white colored block on the left. And the other div is going to represent this photo. It's going to contain this large photo, which I haven't got yet. I'm going to go to Unsplash and grab a brand new photo that I think just looks nice. Something outdoorsy, maybe something fall related since it's fall. So, so that's the plan of action there. <clears throat> I'm probably not going to jump back and refer to these participation three um, directions again. Just so you know, though, we were definitely going to cover participation 3A with our in-class stuff today. So no issues there. And then we're also going to get a head start on 3B as well. So let's see. I'm going to jump back over to my code. <clears throat> so that's what those little divs are going to represent. I'm not worried that they don't have content right now. That's okay. I just wanted to have something on in the body section of the page. Okay, so next order of business is I need to make a st uh, two style sheets, but I'm going to focus on this one first, my reset style sheet. Now, based on my link tag, this style sheet is going to be called reset.css. It's going to be saved in my styles folder. So I'm going to open up a new file, create a new blank file. Just double click right up there. File, save as. And I'm going to save this. I'm in my 195 folder. That's good. I'm going to go into my styles folder. That's better. And I'm going to call this reset.css. OK, so the reset CSS file is going to be kind of like a foundation CSS file that all of my web pages are going to use. And they're going to do some pretty standard foundational things. I know I'm being kind of vague, but uh, I, want to, I want you to see what I'm talking about as I do it. Um, so that way, um, or as I talk about it, so that way it kind of sinks in a little bit better. All my pages are going to use this reset rule. And the first thing I'm going to do is create, I'm going to do a comment here. And this is going to be a simple reset rule. You set page defaults. Okay, so that's a comment. And what I wrote up there is simple reset rule to set page default. So I know that's pretty generic, but here's what I'm gonna write. This is my first CSS reset rule. Asterisk, curly braces, margin zero, padding zero, order zero. And then on another line, box sizing, border box. So this CSS rule contains four declarations. It just looks a little funny because I've put three of the declarations all on one line. And that is a personal habit. It's fine that they're all on one line. It's also fine if they're all on separate lines. That works too. In real life, I actually put all four of these on one line. I just chose to break it up today a little bit. So margin zero, padding zero, border zero, and then box sizing border box. Three of these, you're probably, actually definitely one of them, like border, you probably have a really good idea of what that's doing. Margin and padding, you're probably getting a pretty good idea of what they do because you've seen them a little bit in previous classes and previous resource videos and stuff. Box sizing is the one that you're probably most confused by. But that's okay. Another benefit to me having two divs on this page is it's going to make it really easy to demonstrate what border box, box sizing border box is doing. And once you see it in action with borders and colors and side by side, or actually there'll be one on top of the other to start, um, you're really going to understand what this means. And then you're going to understand why I use it all the time. Now, the other weird thing you're seeing is my selector. My selector is an asterisk. Normally, for a selector, we have a word like body or H1 or P for paragraph. But this time, I have an asterisk. Some of you already know what the asterisk symbol means from other classes you've taken. It does stand for all, Marshall. So the asterisk is a wild card. It does represent all elements. So basically, I'm saying my paragraphs have zero margin, zero padding. My headings have zero margin, zero padding. My headline threes, my divs 
my section tags, my uh, hyperlinks, everything that I put on my web page is going to have zero margins and zero padding to start. This doesn't mean that I won't use margin and padding. I promise you we will. This doesn't mean we're not going to use borders because we definitely will. It just means at a starting point, there are no margins and no padding. In a little bit, once we get some content on my page, I'm going to temporarily delete this rule so you can see what the impact is without it and then with it. Okay, so that's my simple reset rule. Now I'm calling it a simple reset rule because a lot of professional web developers use a more complicated reset rule than that. Okay, I'm not going to use a complicated one, but I want to show you what a complicated one might look like. I typically use a more complicated one in like the 295 class or something. So let me just do a CSS reset rule as a Google search. And um, let's see, what's a good one here? Eric Myers always had a good one. It's an old post. It's been around for a long time. That's right. So yeah, control forward slash, control slash, if you want to instantly quickly comment out or uncomment a line or a chunk. Um, let's see what this one, it's the best CSS reset style sheets. It's the best, must be good if it's the best. And let's see if they give us a nice little example here. Now oh, they're, okay, we can download it, of course. I just wanted to see it. All right, that's not as exciting as I was hoping. All right, I guess we'll go to Eric Myers. Okay, so here we go. And it has been updated lately, but it's still a pretty darn good one. So you can see in this example, actually it is kind of tiny, I know. Um, let me zoom in a bit more. In Eric Meyer's example, it is, by the way, public domain, so technically we could copy and paste this without any concern, but also CSS code and HTML code, not copyrightable, so um, there's no violation. I don't want you to go copy you know, big chunks of somebody else's code, especially if it keeps us from learning it ourselves, but um, I don't want you to worry that doing so is some kind of violation of copyright. So instead of using the asterisk wildcard, they literally spelled out all of the tags that they're likely to use. So instead of the asterisk, which means everything, they wrote everything. And so some of these, of course, make sense to you. The HTML tag, body tag, div, span, you haven't seen applet. There's all the headings right there, paragraph, a um, couple others you've seen maybe, and quite a few that you haven't seen yet. But he's doing the same basic thing. Margin is zero, padding is zero, border is zero. I'm going to do font size in a different area. Um, vertical line baseline, that's actually the alignment of the text up and down. Then they've got a bunch of defaults in here, which is kind of what things are automatically. So look at this. By default, all of their ordered lists and unordered lists are going to have no bullets. So a lot of web developers will intentionally get rid of the bullets, most list. And uh, so that's not necessarily unusual, but it's not one I would typically put in there. And there's a bunch of other stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense to us right now, but it probably will closer to the end of the term. So that is basically a more complicated reset rule. And I was hoping that there's another good web article on reset rules where it kind of breaks down the sections. And I was hoping that would rank up there in the uh, top chunk, but I'm not noticing it right away. I think I might have a link to it in the reset. Eh, I can't remember now. But either way, that's what a big reset rule is. I am perfectly cool with using this simplified one for us. So this might be the only one I use in this class, the same CSS reset rule. There's still nothing exciting for us to check out. However, I am going to do this, even though I'm probably going to delete it soon. Body background color green. I'm probably going to do this just on the short term. Um, actually, may, yeah, I might stay there for a little bit longer. Who knows? But I want to do this very, very soon as I start because I want to make sure that my reset CSS file is truly connected to my, to my web page, my HTML file. I realized that was probably not the best file name for my web page because it would require that I say the word style sheets. And I don't want to confuse you 
that my web page, my HTML file is called style sheets and it's not a style sheet. Um, I did that because that was our topic, but I'm already kind of regretting that file name because it can be confusing. So I'm probably not going to try to refer to my web page by its name. I'm just going to say my web page. So my web page has the link tag to the reset rule. Now I want to see if it's working. So let's see. I think I've got my go live working. I'm going to disconnect it and then I'm going to click my go live button. And there's my there's my web page for today. And it's got a green background. So that confirms to me that my link tag to my reset rule is working. So before you do a lot of work on any external style sheet, it's always nice to get that quick confirmation that things are connected. If it's not connected, confirm the file name for your style sheet, for your CSS file. Confirm that you saved it in the styles subfolder within your main working folder. And then once you've confirmed that, you confirm what you put for your link tag, especially the hyper reference attribute. So whenever a mistake is made, you know, you've seen me make a mistake already today. You'll see me make probably four or five more over the next 90 minutes. It's all a matter of just going back and checking some previous steps, you know, confirming things. All right, I'm happy with that reset rule. I'm not going to get to my page elements yet. There's a couple more things I want to do in this reset rule. After that wild card, I'm going to do another one. This is going to be kind of weird. Colon root, and then a set of co uh, curly braces. Now, I can't remember who asked me about this. It was one of your classmates. So if it gets confusing, you can blame them. I just can't remember who it was, so we don't know who to blame. But about a week ago, somebody asked a question, and now I can't remember if it was during class or even after class. They were asking about, I think, CSS variables, or CSS variables were the, um, were the answer to his question. And I was coming up with this today. So a couple of days ago, I just hate my home web page for 195. I just, I just think it looks bad. So it's just been bothering me. So I came up with a new color palette on uh, coolers and I saved that palette and I've got that off to the side. I said, you know what? I wanna use some new colors. I wanna do some new layout stuff. And I just wanna jazz it up. And this is a great opportunity to use CSS variables. I typically don't show CSS variables in the 195 class. And um, it normally it comes up in the uh, Web Dev 2 course, but they're not complicated. And once you see them used, I think you'll get the hang of it. It's not a bad thing to do. And I think it's actually going to make things a little bit more logical. And it's a pretty pro way to go. In fact, most, even big websites, I would bet most of them don't use CSS variables, even though it's a pretty efficient thing to do. And it's also going to make it easier for us to change certain things like color schemes. So the color scheme I picked, it looks kind of reminds me of fall, Halloween, you know, got oranges and dark colors and stuff like that and grays. But what if I change my mind and I want to change it to spring colors and stuff like that? CSS variables are going to make it easy for me to change my colors out for my website. So root as a selector is basically the same thing as typing in HTML as a selector. So the HTML selector is the same thing as root. I could even write it this way, colon root comma HTML. That means exactly the same thing though. So you would never see that in real life. Some websites will use colon root. Some websites will use HTML. And so that this is a little bit clear, let me comment this one as well. This is gonna be basically default styles for the root slash HTML. I'm gonna put colon root. I just think it looks neater. It's maybe yeah, a little bit more pro or something a little bit common. And of course, this is already kind of weird. I'm gonna start off with a default font size. Font size, I've already forgot what I wanna do, but hold on, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm doing a little calculator thing. I think it's 62, I think this is what I want. No, 
62.5%. Okay, that's a weird number. <laughs> okay, so here's why I'm coming up with 62.5%. I got my little calculator handy here. So basically, the default font size for a web page is about 16 pixels. Okay, so whenever you hear of a font size like 1M or a standard font, 16 pixels is usually the default size. So 16 pixels times 0.625, which is 62.5%, equals 10. So by telling the browser that I want my font size to be 62.5% of the default, if the default is 16, that's basically saying my root font size is gonna be 10 pixels. That's very, very odd. So let me put a little comment off to the side. That's basically 16 pixels times 60 times 0.625 equals 10 pixels. And this is going to be my root. I'm not going to even say default. I'm going to say it's my root font size. This is something else that usually doesn't come up until the WebDev2 class. So I'm going to have to think of a whole bunch of new topics for the WebDev2 students, apparently. So, All right. Now, this is kind of weird. However, this is going to allow us to use a unit of measurement that you haven't seen yet, but you've seen it on other sites like Apple. It's called the root M, R-E-M. So we're going to be using a lot of root M's today, R-E-M font sizes. And once I start to apply it, this is going to make a little bit more sense. It isn't super critical that we do this to make our fonts default to 10 pixels, but working with units of 10 pixels is really easy to work with. It's easier to work with than 16. It's easier for us to do math based on 10 than math based on 16. So that's the whole reason for that. Again, once you see me start to apply these fonts in a number of situations coming up, it's all going to start to make sense. But this is my default styles for the root, and that's one of them right there. That's not it. I also want to set some default, um, some CSS variables. So I'm going to go down here. In fact, I'll do a line space. I'm still within my root rule, my root rule. And I'm going to put in, let's see, I've got a little note off to the side. Dot, uh, let's see, dot, dot, um, color dash, or I'm sorry, dash, dash, not dot, dot, dash, dash, color dash, BG for background. I'll say BG1 for background one. That's going to be a colon. And then I'm going to put in my hex code. And what I, I'm looking off to my other screen, because I got my little, uh, I got my uh, color palette over there. So I'm just kind of glancing at that. And I've got a couple colors that I'm, that's why I did background one, because I might end up having a couple of background options. This needs to be hashtag. I think I'm going to try the light color first. And that is E, E, E5, E9, semicolon. That's a CSS variable. Haven't used it yet, but you're going to see it soon enough. I'm going to do another one here. In fact, I'll do some comments. Try to do more comments. Um, good enough. All right, let's do another one. Dash, dash, color, dash, BG2. I might have two different backgrounds that I use, and there's this tan color that looks kind of nice. Hashtag EFC88B. So I've got this whitish color, what very light gray, and I've got this tannish color that I might go for. Oh, of course, you can see them right there with my little thumbnails. Okay, that's going to be the start of my CSS variables for site colors. A line space in there, just so. We're not going to be spending a ton of time on this reset rule. Basically, the goal for this is to set a bunch of foundational things for our web pages, and then it's kind of you set it and forget it. And this is kind of what all of the pages would use. So Apple can have hundreds or thousands of web pages, but those thousands of web pages are all going to have the same background color, the same fonts, the same font sizes, the same layout. And basically, that's all controlled with a CSS file. So that's pretty good. In fact, it's even enough for us to do an initial test. So I'm going to go to the body rule that I have down here. If you don't have a body rule, you might go ahead and create a quick one right down there. 
In fact, I'll retype mine. Body. Background. Color. Now, my goal isn't to type in red or green or yellow to test my CSS linking. I already know my link up works. What I'm testing now is my CSS variable. So what I'm going to write now is going to be var parentheses dash dash color dash bg2, just like that. So I'm not referring to the color directly. I'm referring to the variable that represents the color, in this case, my shade of tan. Now, of course, if it's working, when I go to my web page, I should see that tan background instead of the green background. If I see anything other than that yellowish tan, then I've got a mistake somewhere. So let me jump over. And already I can tell just by looking at my little thumbnails in my alt tab that things are going well, which means I could, well, let's go back there. I could change this out to background one pretty easily. And now I've got that lightish, very light gray, almost white background, which is actually what I wanted to go for, but I knew that tan would probably jump out a little bit more to us. So that's nice. And here's what's great about variables. If I use that particular color in different places and I change my mind about that color, all I need to do is go up to my root and I change the hex code here and it's gonna change every instance of that, that color use, that color usage. So that is a CSS variable. I'm probably gonna do a few more of these, but if you only did background color, that's pretty nice. Do I wanna do a couple more right now? I think I do. Let me go ahead and set up a couple more variables. Dash color. By the way, I'm starting these with the word color, not because I need to. You do start with a dash dash, but then you can call them anything you want. I do it this way though, because sometimes I create CSS variables for fonts. Sometimes I create CSS variables for sizes and stuff like that. And so I use this, this naming syntax so that I can glance at them and they're all kind of organized. So I know it's a color. For instance, color dash, and this is gonna be font one. This is gonna be my standard font color. And I'm looking at my little color swatch and I think I'm gonna do, and my little color swatches, my palette, one of my choices is pure black. I really never like to use pure black. So even though I've got pure black on there, I would probably soften that a bit with like one, 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 or maybe two, 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 which are very dark grays, almost black. I don't like to use pure white and I don't like to use pure black. I find them too harsh on the web page. Soften the colors even just a little bit. It's kind of pleasing. So um, so for my color font one, I think what'll look good is one of those darker colors. So I'm just going to do hashtag two, 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 two. Okay. Super dark gray, almost black. And then I'm going to do color dash accent one. Now my accent color is going to be orange. Hashtag C F five C three, six. There we go. Um, yeah, I've also got that gray on there. I don't know if I'll end up using that. Just because your palette might have five colors in it doesn't mean you have to use all five. I will, yeah, I'm not even gonna put it on there. That's good enough. All right, feeling pretty good about this so far. So if my background color variable is that background one, I could also do something like this so that my color that's my font color, by the way, is going to be variable dash dash color dash font one. So now my web page is going to have a default background color based on a variable and a default text color based on a variable. My web page doesn't have any text on it though, so I can't test it, but soon enough I will be able to. All right. Um, let's see, am I done with this for now? I might be done with this for now. Oh, let's do this. The default font size for my web page. That's a cute little pup there, Reagan. Um, font size. Now, for my font size, remember my default size for my fonts is 10 pixels. That's actually kind, that's pretty small. You don't want a font size to be that small. I'd prefer it be something closer to 15 or 16 pixels. Actually, that might be a little too big, too big, maybe 12 to 14 pixels. But here's what's great about this. Because my root size is 10 pixels, don't forget, how did I get 10 pixels? 16 pixels multiplied 
by uh, 62 and a half percent. That gets me to 10 pixels. So now if I want my default font size on my page to be 14 pixels, I do 1.4 REMs. There we go. That's what's convenient about setting the default to 10. So if I want to do a font size of 20 pixels, it's two REMs. If I want um, 30 pixels, three REMs. If I want one and a, if I want 15 pixels, 1.5 REMs. So by using that unit of 10, it's going to make it easier to do this. It's called a root M. So an M is a relational font size, a relative font size, actually is the better word. And a root M is the same thing, but it's based off this default root start. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Once again, nothing for me to test out because I don't have any text on my page. So I think I'm, is, I think I'm reasonably done with my reset rule. I'm not gonna close it though, in case I come back and I wanna add something on here. My reset CSS file is basically there to set some really core foundational stuff for my website, my web page, my web pages and stuff. The other reset rule, or I'm sorry, the other CSS file I'm going to do is where we're going to spend most of our time and work on the actual elements within the body, the actual visual, you know, the page content and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new file. File, save as. And this is going to go into my styles folder. And I think I'm going to call it page-elements.css. Okay. I'm going to do a quick test to see if this external style sheet file is connected properly to my web page. Body. Background color. Yellow. Okay, so page-elements.css. I think I've got it saved properly in the right folder, I mean. And I'm pretty sure that this link tag is written properly, style slash page-elements.css. I've got a rule, which would be obvious, that bright yellow. There it is, bright yellow. Now, why is the background color of my page yellow? Why isn't it that really light, creamy white color that I picked earlier. Why is it yellow instead of the creamy white? Any theories on that? Do you have to call the reset? No, nope, my reset is being done. Uh, okay. It's right up here. I mean, like, as in, like, calling, like, a function? Oh, no, no, no need. Okay. Yep, so I've got two CSS files working. However, and I've got two rules that are controlling the background color of my page. Uh, Grady's got it. He's put a question mark, so he's not getting the confidence points, but he's actually got the right answer. So I've got two CSS files. They each contain a body background color declaration. One of them wins. The second one wins. So it is the order of the links. It, you're right. Daniel's right, too. The page styles from top to bottom. And that is why we have to put our Google font links first. We put our Google font links first, and then I put my reset, and then I put the unique things on the page. But you can create conflicts with your CSS, but whatever comes last wins. So that's what's going on there. It's even crazier. Check this out real quick. You don't have to do this part because I'm gonna delete it. There we go. Style equals background color purple. Now my background color is purple. It's called an inline style. I've seen a couple of students in, in class do this on their assignment stuff. So now my background color is purple. I have, I have three declarations competing with each other. I have my CSS reset, which is telling it to be creamy white. I've got my page element CSS, which is telling it to be yellow. And now I have an inline style, which is telling it to be purple. Again, it's all about the order. What happens first? The reset rule happens first and it says creamy white. But then again, this one comes along and overrides the previous and says, no, be yellow. But then this one comes along after those two and says, nope, be purple, okay? So 
You don't want to intentionally create all these conflicts, um, but sometimes conflicts are going to happen, and it's the order of those CSS rules that are really kind of controlling what wins and what doesn't. I'm going to delete this inline style. Sometimes we will do this, but it will be very rare. Um, so there's a couple students that are doing this, seems like quite a bit, um, and that's okay starting off. But as we get into weeks three and four, I'm going to transition you away from doing inline styles, away from doing internal styles, which is the style tag inside of the um, head section. And I'm going to push you a little bit more into using external styles. Now I'm happy with my reset background color. This background color of yellow, by the way, now that I've gotten rid of that, I'm back to yellow. This was just there so that I could see that things were connected. It is so I can get rid of it. And of course now my page goes back to that creamy white, off white color. All right. We've done a lot of work. Class has almost been going on for like 45 minutes. And there's our web page. It's got a header with two blank divs. <laughs> so making web pages is sometimes a slow process. You know, you can spend tons of time on some little aspect of it. So let's start doing something a little bit more meaningful. I want to style these divs and I want to style it in a way so that I can really demonstrate what this reset rule is doing. Okay. So I'm going to put a few things on here. Oh, crap. You already have a page called page underscore elements. Is it safe to delete that? It is. Um, yeah, you don't need to delete it because this is page element CSS. I don't think that's, is that, you've already got one called that? That's a bummer. Um, you might just call this a different name. I wouldn't be too quick to delete old pages and files you've made. So unless you know for a fact you're not using it for any kind of assignment or it was just practice. Um, only delete stuff if you feel really confident that you don't want to reference it at some point in the future, or I don't need to reference it um, at some point in the future. A mistake I'm kind of making, I don't know why I'm not doing it this term, but normally whenever I would create files for class, I would actually put like a little week two or week three or week four right in front of every file. So that way they would sort by, by week number if you did them alphabetically. And I thought about it briefly at the beginning of class, but I chose not to, and I'm not 100% sure why I chose not to, but I think mostly because I planned on having a whole mixture of files in there, so who knows? But yeah, it's just a file name syntax. Okay, back to this um, section here. So I've got a header section. I still have my body rule, but there's no declarations in there. I'm just gonna kind of pretend it doesn't exist for a minute. I'll come back to it soon enough. The header. And I'm going to put a border on there that is eight pixels solid. Ooh. Bar color font one. Okay, I'm putting a border on my header. I'm also going to do a min height of 80 pixels. So there are two declarations for the header. Remember, on my HTML file, I've got an element called header. So on my CSS, I'm telling it to have a dark border. I just have to remember that this CSS variable represents a dark color for me. It's like two, 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 two. It's my, what I'm using for my font color. And a minimum height of 80 pixels. So now when I look at my page, I can see it right up there. It's actually kind of tough to see. I'm going to change my color out to accent one. So now it's orangey. I like that better. Now I put a min height of 80 pixels on there for a reason, because if I didn't have that min height, it would scrunch up on itself. You wouldn't even realize that the header is a block. It just looks like it's just because there's no content. The two divs in my header are empty, which means the header collapses on itself. So you can't really tell. 
So by putting min height of 80 pixels, it allows us to see it as an actual rectangle, as an actual box. And uh, since I'm using min height instead of height, it can still grow taller if and when necessary. Make sense so far? I'm putting a border on an element where with my reset rule, I said I didn't want any borders, but now I'm overriding that top to bottom, right? The reset rule occurred first, no borders. Then now I've got my page element style sheet and I'm saying I do want a border. Whatever comes second wins. So, or whatever comes last. So now I do have a border that I can see. All right, I'm good with that. Now within this header, hmm, do I wanna do it this way? Sure I do. Within this header, let's write it this way. Header space div. Now I'm using a different kind of selector. Basically, in fact, let me do some little comments up here. This is called a type selector. A type selector is basically, you've seen this a lot, it's when we just want to focus on one particular element and we just refer to it by its tag name. But now I've got something else called a descendant selector. A descendant selector is going to style an element that's a descendant of another element. Now, descendant can be a child. It can be a grandchild, great-grandchild, great-great-grandchild, and on and on and on. So as long as that div is somewhere within the header. And if you recall from my HTML file, my divs are within the header. So my divs are definitely descendants of the header. They're technically child elements, but a child is a descendant. A child is a descendant, but a descendant isn't necessarily a child. Okay, so I'm styling those CSS, or I'm sorry, I'm styling those divs within the header. And those are gonna have a border that's eight pixels. Actually, I'm gonna do 10 pixels here because 10 is easier to add up and I'm gonna need to add these momentarily. 10 pixels, solid, and I'm gonna kind of deviate here and I'll just make these a dark red. Now, while I'm here, I'm also gonna give a min height of 80 pixels. And I'm also gonna give them some margin of 100 pixels. That's kind of big, but um, that's okay. Actually, I'll dial it back to 80 since I can use 80 a lot. Okay, my divs are gonna have a noticeable thick red border. They're gonna have at least a little bit of default height and they're also gonna have a margin, which is space outside of the border. So you can really see those two divs pretty well. They have a lot of margin. Margin is outside the border. Padding is on the inside of the border. I'm not worried about padding at the moment. So yeah, so that's why they have all that space around them. Cool, and we can clearly see both of them quite well. Now don't do this, but I'm gonna run back to my reset rule and I'm gonna momentarily get rid of my reset rule. I'm going to put it back, but I want you to see what happens now when I go back to my page. You probably don't notice much. However, look at this header, this orangey border on my header. It's got space around it, whereas before it didn't. By default, web pages have padding and margin, and it's a little different for the different browsers. And so one of the benefits of a reset rule is it sets everything to zero so that we can create consistent looks in different web browsers. Now that problem used to be much more pronounced a few years back. It's not so bad now, but the benefit of the reset rule is still there. And it sets everything to a level playing field by setting everything to zero. And then when we want margins, when we want padding, when we want borders, we specifically tell the browser what we want and how big they need to be. So at a glance, control Z to undo, it doesn't seem like the reset rule is doing anything too dramatic, but it actually is helping us out in the long run. As we make more complicated web pages, it's going to allow us to create more consistent designs and have a little bit more control over how we want our pages to look. 
So I've got my reset rule back in. However, you still don't really have an appreciation of the box sizing property. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to comment that one out. I'm not gonna use box sizing border box temporarily, which means I'm not using it. This is the bummer about using live server. It refreshes so quickly, you don't really get to see it. Uh, sometimes when I'm not using live server in class, I'll like, okay, now watch carefully. I'm gonna hit the reload button and you'll see the change happen. So that's okay. I think we can get by it. What I wanna do next is I wanna go to my elements here. And in addition to these having these characteristics, my divs within my header, I'm gonna set their width to something we can easily add up, 500 pixels. So both of my divs are gonna have red borders, 10 pixels thick. They're gonna have 80 pixels of height, which doesn't factor into what we're about to do. They're gonna have 80 pixels of margin, and they're gonna have 500 pixels of width. And there they are. I'm gonna make it 400 pixels of width, so then you can clearly see that by default, they're a little bit to the left of the web page. Okay, that's the default nature, a line to the left. If I want these to be centered, I'm gonna do this. I changed my margin to 80 pixels top and bottom, auto left and right. That is how you center a block element on your web page. There you go, they're centered. That is one of the ways you center a block element on your web page. Okay, it's a real quick, easy way. Um, other ways involve using maybe grid or even better Flexbox, I think, um, but we'll get to those later on. This is a very fast, common, easy way to center a block element. Text align center doesn't center a block element. Text align center centers text or inline elements that are within a block. So this is how you center a block element. I'm quite certain that this will be a quiz question, not just in one future quiz, but probably in at least two future quizzes. I use that same question a couple times because I really want to stress that. How do you center a block element? Well, the key is auto margin on the left and the right. Okay. So now we can see those two. All right, that's well enough. Let's see, I'm gonna do a couple things here. I'm going to change the margin top and bottom to 20 pixels, because I want them to be a little closer together, a little closer because the next thing I do, I want you to be able to compare the first one to the second one. So here's how I'm gonna write this. Header div, Last child, don't need that. Box sizing border box. Let me test this real quick just to make sure it's doing what I expect. It is doing what I expect. Okay. I'm probably gonna end up deleting this or commenting it out. It's not there for long-term use. It's just there so that I can compare. Both of my divs are 400 pixels wide. My second div has box sizing border box applied to it. I'm gonna come back to this CSS in just a moment. So now the question is, how wide is the top one? It's clearly wider than the bottom. We can see that. How wide is the top one? Type your answer in the chat. It's a number in pixels. You're close, Brian, but it's actually a little bigger than 400. I'll tell you this, the bottom one is definitely 400, and maybe that's what you were answering. The bottom one is definitely 400 pixels wide. How wide is the top one? Perfect, Ryan's got it, 420. So 
which I guess is a uh, pot reference that I was not intending to make. So why 420? Because he's adding up. There's 10 pixels of border on the left. There's 10 more pixels of border on the right, plus the 400 on the inside. That's where we get that 420 from. So the reason I like to use box sizing border box on my reset rule is because I can be very explicit with it. If I tell my browser that I want my div to be 400 pixels wide, I really want it to be 400 pixels wide. I don't want it to be 410, 420, 450. I want it to be what I said I want it to be, 400 pixels. So by putting box sizing border box on there, I can be assured that I've got a 400 pixel wide box. Now it does mean that the interior is only 380, but that's okay. When I'm working on web page layouts and key elements, it's the outside width, the total width, which I'm most concerned with. Um, obviously, if I made my border thinner or if I made the whole box bigger, like 420, then I can control it. So that's the value of box sizing border box. Not essential at all, but it makes it easier to structure key elements on your page and know exactly how wide they are, especially if you are using borders. So that's why on my reset rule, I like all elements to have box sizing border box, because then when I tell them to be 400 pixels wide, I don't have to control them individually. I know for a fact they are all going to be 400 pixels wide. Cool. All right, so that's my descendant selector controlling those divs. Feeling pretty good about this. And lo and behold, well, okay, we've got one rule that has at least three declarations in it, okay? So that's one third of the participation activity. Let's go ahead and take care of a couple others though. I'm gonna head back over to my style sheets one. I'm sorry, I'm gonna head back to my web page. And I wanna better identify these two divs. Now you've already seen, or at least you saw a second ago, that I can refer to, the, to my second div by calling it div last child. And I could have referred to this div as div first child. That's kind of a ham-handed way of doing it. It's okay sometimes, and there are situations when that's even the best way. But in this example, I think what would be more appropriate is if these divs had their names, which identified their purpose. So this is gonna be ID equals header text. And this other div is gonna be ID equals header photo. I'm giving each of these divs a unique ID because they are gonna have some unique purposes. I still like that I'm using div tags as opposed to some other tag, but I wanna differentiate them. I wanna know that they've got unique purposes. So I'm giving them IDs. Now the IDs I'm giving them, I'm completely making up, okay? You can call them anything you want, but they can't start with a number and they can't have any spaces in them. Now, normally in class, I might use an underscore or something like that, and that's still okay, or I'd give them shorter names, but I'm teaching a JavaScript class this term as well, and I wanted to do another example of camel case, so that way for any crossover technique. So camel case is when you start off a multi-word situation, you start off with a lower case, and then subsequent words have an uppercase. Is it bad practice to use class instead? Great question. It is not bad practice. And in fact, I'm going to be using class as well. Probably if I don't get to it today, I'll definitely use it tomorrow. And there are many web developers that are that highly prefer using the class as opposed to the ID. The reason is, is because when you use ID, you can only use that ID once per page. With a class, you can use it multiple times per page. You can also use a class once per page. So class is a little bit easier to work with in that regard. However, I do want you to know about IDs and I, I like IDs and I'm gonna use both IDs and classes. And the reason I'll divvy them up a little bit is because I think there's some situations where we can use class where it's gonna make a lot more realistic sense on why would I use class versus IDs. But for now, the reason I'm using IDs is because I know I'm only gonna have one chunk of header text and I'm only gonna have one chunk of header photo on this web page. 
Okay, so now they have IDs. Great. What do I do with that? Well, I go to my page elements and I'm going to refer to an ID selector. Hashtag header text and then a set of curly braces. I'm going to do another one. Hashtag header photo in a set of curly braces. When I want to refer to an element by its ID, I put a hashtag in front of the selector. If I was referring to an element by its class, I would use a dot instead of a hashtag. So since I'm doing ID selectors right now, I'm using hashtags. Um, Marshall, if you want to experiment with using class, cool, go for it. You would use a dot instead of a hashtag. All right. Well, I still don't have any header text, so let me jump over and create some header text. Within my div, I'm going to have h1, and this is going to be uh, participation 3a, and maybe 3d, <laughs> all mixed in. And I'm also doing this because this is probably going to be my future index page for my web dev homepage. So I'll probably end up doing some copying and saving and re-editing and stuff like that. So I'm hoping it'll make a good homepage. All right. So I've got that H1 there. Of course, I like a paragraph right after that. Um, I'll put my name there. You put your name on yours if you're putting anyone's name. By the way, whenever you write that, uh, that author, you're not putting my name in there, right? You're putting your own name. I've seen students do that before, but normally it's in a face-to-face -face class where they're literally, they're writing everything I'm writing and they'll put my name as the author. So you put your own name there as the author. Of course, I did initials today. Okay. All right. So I've got a little bit of text space in there. That's cool. All right. That's text. All right. I don't have my cool font for my Google font. So back when I was getting my Google font, I had this little line down here, font family. I know you can't read that, but let me copy that. Head back to my style sheet. And let's see, do I want to do this in the body? I think I do. Yep. I'm going to paste that up there. So I've got a body rule on my page element style, and I'm going to put my font family up there. Remember, that's my fancy Google font that I'm using. And uh, yep, I can definitely see it's changed. So it looks like it's working. So I'm happy with that. Um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'm good with that. This is something you might consider putting on the reset or the default styles, but I think I'm good with it for there. And let's see, what else do I wanna do? Now my header text, I'm gonna do this. Text align center. I want all of the text in my header text div to be centered. So text align center. It's going to center my headlink. It's going to center my H1. And it's also going to center my paragraph. Remember, my header, header text has a heading one and a paragraph in there. So now it's centered. Now, I don't like the way that's breaking like that. So I'm going to jump back over to here. And in between, I'm going to put a little break tag right there. Participation 3A and maybe 3B. So this is how you create a line break within a paragraph, or in this example, within a heading. So if you want to break to a new line without actually creating a new instance of that element or a new element, you can just put a break in there. One line break. It's like pressing the, um, it's like pressing shift enter in Microsoft Word. Not the enter key, but shift enter. Shift enter is a line break in Word. Okay, so now it's split up on two lines. Cool. I know maybe font sizes need to be adjusted, but I think I'm okay with that for now. What I want to do next is I want to jump over and I want to put a photo in my header photo. So I need to jump to unsplash. And since I've got a fall color scheme going and I like outdoorsy photos, I'm going to do a search for fall. 
And I'm just going to see what we get. I'm mostly looking for a landscape orienta orientation photo. I want it to be wider than it is tall. And I don't want to spend a, a ton of time on here. I don't want any people on mine because it's going to, I'm probably going to use this for my homepage. So I don't necessarily want a person on there because you're going to think, hey, that's not what Ralph looks like. He's much better looking than that person. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get a little colors. I want a little motif going on. Um, actually, I kind of like that one there with the orangey leaves. That looks pretty good. That looks cool to me. Can't go wrong with pumpkins. Actually, I think I Timothy Eberly. I'm going to click on this one. I, I really like that. It looks good to me. I'm going to download a free one. I'm going to get the small version, I think. So I'm going to download the small photo. I'm going to save it. Let's see, where is this going to go? This is going to go to my Google Drive, COCC, Demos, RR Phillips, 195, Images. And I guess I could have used my slug picture, but uh, I'm going to call this one Fall Leaves. That's a lot of L's. I'll just call it leaves.jpg. It's already a JPG. I'm not going to change the file name. I'm going to save it. So now I've got it saved in my images folder within my web space. I'm going to close that. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'm just going to get that one photo. Okay. Now I'm not using the image tag to insert that photo. I'm going to use CSS to insert a background image. So I'm going to go back to my page elements, my header photo, and I'm going to write background image URL dot dot slash images slash leaves.jpg. Because I'm in my styles folder, I needed the dot dot slash to go upward into the folder tree. And then I go to my images folder and then down to my leaves picture. That's why I'm doing it that way. I'm also going to go ahead and throw in background size cover and background position center. I briefly mentioned background size cover before. I haven't talked about background position center, but I'm not going to. I think it might come up probably in a future class. So, and it kind of self-explanatory anyway. Ooh, let's see if it's working. Hey, I got some leaves. Nice. Now, with these heights, oh, in fact, you can kind of tell. My first div is taller than my second div. That's because I have so much content in there. My first div is stretching taller and taller. Remember, I put a min height of 80 pixels, a minimum height. So this one is at the, the bottom one is at the minimum height of 80 pixels. The top one is taller. I don't know how tall, but it's definitely taller. It's stretching taller because of the content. So I could go to those and say min height 120 pixels, and they will both stretch taller. Actually, it looks pretty good. They're both balanced now. Still, they don't have to be the same height, but um, I've got them as the same height. In fact, I think I want them to be taller. Um, what about 240? How's that looking? Ultimately, these two blocks that are one on top of the other, I want them to be side by side, and one's going to overlap the other a little bit. So I'm kind of okay with that, but I also might want them to be different heights. Now, the way I've got this structured, both divs are being controlled by this rule, which means they both have the same minimum height. If I want them to have different heights, well, then I need to control it down here so I can control them independently. So if I don't like controlling their minimum height here, I could leave that, by the way, and then I could override it down there. So that's not a bad way to go. I could say, you know what? I want my top one to have a min height of 100 pixels. And by doing that, the top one's going to be noticeably shorter. So I'm creating an intentional override. That's kind of risky, though. I, I promise you, I, I get questions every term. Ralph, I type this in my CSS up here, and it's not doing anything. That's because later on down in the line, you have something else that's overriding it. You forgot about it. So when you write it this way, it, does, it can create some problems for yourself. 
as our CSS files get bigger and bigger and more complicated, you'll be working on line 140, and then you'll go back to line 38, and you'll do some work there, and you forgot about line 140, and it's easy to kind of forget what's being controlled. So I'm going to get rid of the min height for both divs equally, and instead, I'm going to control it down here. I'll set a min height of 200 pixels, and my header photo is going to have a min height 300 pixels. It's going to be definitely bigger than the first one. There we go. Now I want to get them side by side. We don't have too much class left, but I think we have enough time to still get some basic things going on here. Let me get them side by side. So what I'm going to do with my header text, that's my first div. I want that to be towards the left. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to say float left. Is that the way I want to do it? Hmm. There could be a better way. There, actually, there definitely is a better way, but I don't want to show you the better way today. So I'm wondering, do I show you the slightly better way today in anticipation for an even better way next week or the week after? That kind of thing. Well, at least let me show you this here. So float left for the first one. Float right for the second one. I need to get my little semicolon there. So I'm going to do a float left on the header text and a float right on the header photo. And that will get them over to the left and over to the right. I want you to ignore that orange border for a moment. At the very least, though, one box is to the left and the other box is to the right. So it kind of works. Still, not exactly. It's, it's going to require a bunch of other things. And I don't really like this example of using float. Float is pretty cool. Float really comes in handy when you want to take an object and move it to one side and then have text wrap around that item. So float's really good in that situation. So I think we'll do float again later on. This is, and it creates this container collapse that we have to resolve and which we'll do in the future as well. Okay, so float left, I'm gonna comment that out. I don't like that method. And we'll go a little bit, a little bit, a little bit trickier. Okay, by the way, commenting those out puts them back the way they were. Okay, here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go to my header. That's the orange bordered block that contains both of these divs. And I'm going to write position relative. Ah, there we go. And I'm going to put position relative on my header. My header contains those divs that I'm working with. Position relative. Will you notice the reaction by putting position relative on there? You will not. This does nothing noticeable. But it's still important. There you go. They still look the way they did before. Okay. What I need to do now is go to my... Okay, so this is on my header element. It's position relative. Cool. I did want that. Now I'm going to go to my header text. And I'm going to do position absolute semicolon left zero pixels semicolon top zero pixels. That's going to do something a little different. Let me jump over. I'm going to come right back to this. By the way, that's what I have. I forgot I did that a bunch on Tuesday or yeah, or last Thursday, I mean. Yeah, that's what I have inside of my header text block in the chat. And when I look at my page now, I want you to ignore the messiness. But notice where my header text is. It's more to the left. Before, it was centered up there on the top. Interesting. I'm going to go to my header photo, do something very similar. Position, colon, absolute, semicolon, right, 
zero pixels, semicolon, top, zero pixels, semicolon. So this, let me select that. In the chat is the syntax I have for my header photo. When I look at this on the page, hmm, interesting. Well, my header text is definitely towards the left. And my um, header photo is definitely towards the right. Now I've got this space. You can see this white space above both of these blocks. My red border divs have a space above them. Why do they have that space? Margin top, that's right. On my divs, they have margin of 20 pixels on top. So if I don't want that up there, in fact, I really don't need it too much because I'm not centering these anymore. The whole point of having 20 pixels top and bottom is kind of not necessary anymore. The whole point of doing auto left and right to center them is not necessary anymore. I don't wanna get rid of that completely though because I do want you to see that. So I'm just going to, oops comment out that whole line. So they no longer have that margin top and bottom. They no longer have the auto margin left and right. So now they're gonna be pushed up right up against those corners. Now you're also gonna notice that my orange box there, it's all collapsed in. What happens is whenever you position stuff like I've done here, the container, the parent container collapses because it doesn't know how tall to be. That's a pretty normal thing. And I'm not too worried about it here. The only reason it stands out to you is because I've got that orange border. If I were to go to that header and get rid of my border, you wouldn't even know, okay? So some problems on a web page only stand out because you have borders and visual elements that you don't really intend to be on there. I never intended there to be a border on that section. Um, by the way, if I did want that border there, there's some fixes, but I don't think I want to get into the fixes today. They're not tough, but I've thrown a ton of new stuff at you um, this afternoon. So I don't want to throw even more at you. It's like, um, it's like we were, uh, when I was kids, I grew up in kind of a uh, white trashy little town in uh, central Florida. And uh, we would have rock fights. So all the neighborhood kids, you know, we throw rocks at each other. I know it's crazy. And of course you learn pretty easy. You take some PVC pipe, fill it up with rocks and you sling it like a baseball bat and you got yourself an entire barrage of rocks, you know, garbage cans for shields and stuff. And it's amazing. We all left the Nodasasa with both eyes intact and stuff. But uh, so it's like, that's what, I, that's what I'm doing to you right now. I'm just slinging all these, these little pieces of information at you. And of course, at some point you're gonna hold up that garbage can lid shield and uh, maybe some of them get through, but it's tough, it's scary. But when you're working on this on your own this week, what I'll want you to do is have my code nearby or have the video of the class recording nearby and, and just kind of type, retype some stuff and start to change a couple things. If you feel like using CSS variables is overwhelming, don't use them, okay? And just go on to some other things and change colors, do a different photo, you know? and. You've seen a couple things, which I haven't really explained, but you saw this position absolute. You saw that I used left and top, and then I used right and top. Well, what happens if you did left and bottom or right and bottom? Does that give you a different reaction? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, what if you forget to put in position relative? Does that change something? It might or it might not, depends on what's going on. So experiment a little bit. Nothing bad happens, you know? Your page looks a little different than maybe what you thought. You have a choice. You can either work harder or ask questions. And, hey, I'm trying to get my page to look like this. How does that work? Or you say, you know what? This looks better. I say, you know what? That's what I intended all along. So we've got a few things going on. And I'm pretty happy with this, but I'm going to do one more thing because I really want this chunk of text over here to kind of overlap this photo a little bit, my header text. So 
what's a good way to do this without being too crazy? Uh, I think I know what I want to do. Okay, so I'm going to take my header text, and instead of positioning it from the left, I'm going to position it from the right. It's going to look kind of weird. Yeah, maybe it doesn't look as weird as you think. My text is actually behind the photo. I need that text in front of the photo. So I'm going to do this as well. Z index of 10 is going to put that text on top. So I've got two positioned elements and one is on top of the other and I want to swap them out. I want the one in the back to be in the front. So I'm giving it a big Z index. You know, X is horizontal, Y is vertical, Z is that third dimension. That's how we control layering. I picked 10 just because it was a big number. The bigger, when you have two elements with Z index, the bigger the number, the more on top it is. We'll experiment more with that in a future class. Okay, so I've got that up there. To make this header text a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna do background color RGBA 15, 15, 15, comma, point six. That's not what I want. I want um, 215, 215 comma 215. I want it to be a light color. That's a little darker than I want. 235. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Okay, this is a, a way that you can do semi-transparent colors. I think we did this once, I believe. I remember typing it. I don't remember if, um, if it was in a live class or part of a little resource video. But basically, RGBA, this is a different way of doing colors, by the way. The numbers can be 0 to 255. The closer they are to the 255, the brighter they are. So by being close to 255, 255, 255, which is white, the color I picked is a very light gray. And then this fourth value over here is the transparency. If this number was 1, it would be a solid, solid opaque. Solid color, no big deal. By lowering this to 0.8, it becomes a little bit see-through. You can hardly see the leaves behind it. By going to 0.6, it's more transparent, and you can start to see more leaves. If I did a really small number, like 0.2, it would be so transparent, you would hardly even notice that there was another color there. So I'm going to pick 0.6. Okay. So I'm pretty good with that one. Now, what is the width of my header photo? The width, width, width. Where's the width? The width is up here somewhere. It is 400 pixels wide. I'm going to use that number to my advantage. My divs are 400 pixels wide. So my positioning for my header text is going to be 350 pixels from the right. I'm going to do a number less than 400. And I'm going to do... 100 pixels from the top. I'm going to see how that looks. It's probably too much. It is too much. I think 50 pixels would look better. There we go. That's kind of the look I'm going for. In fact, maybe I'll dial it back a little. 320. So my header text is 320 from the right, even though the leaves picture is 400 pixels wide. That creates that little bit of overlap of about um, 80 pixels. And it's positioned about 50 pixels from the top, which gives it enough space up there. I think that looks pretty good. Now, this whole idea is coming from that participation activity where we had one block overlap another block. So that's where I'm getting that idea from. So just looking at websites, you don't have to look at an entire web page because that can be overwhelming too. But you can look at one aspect of a web page to get a little bit of, hmm, interesting. I like that one corner or that one section. You know, you're at a website and anybody been to a website lately that's uh, kid-friendly?
What's the last website you went to, Reagan? Type it in the chat. NOAA, okay, so NOAA, probably a .gov. Let's check it out. Okay, so here's interesting examples. We're not gonna do this today, but this is often how you'll learn a lot of things about CSS and web page design and layout. You're looking at this website, and the first thing you do is like, wow, do you like this site? Either you do or you don't. And then maybe there's aspects that you like, that you like better than others. <clears throat> okay. So here's what I like about this website. For one thing, when I scroll up and down, I like this fixed navigation menu off to the left. Very cool. You see, I scroll up and down and it stays right there. That's pretty neat. Not very tough to do either. Not going to do it today, but let's file that away for a future uh, experiment. So that's pretty cool. Now, the thing I don't like is they're using these icons, which is tough on usability. Usability is a topic that's going to come up later in our term, maybe at the very end. And when you use this iconography in order to represent sections, it's not very clear to visitors what these links represent. We could guess, but why make your user guess when you could have just used words? So it's a little, that's, a, that's a, something that's not very good. Now, what else are they doing? Well, I really like this photo on the background, and I like the text on top. So that's pretty neat. I like having big, bold text on an interesting background photo. But here's what I don't like. The photo they used has too many light colors in it. So the white text is tough to read on the light background. This is not enough contrast. And this would actually be a problem for visitors with vision impairments. It makes the text just a little bit harder to read than it needs to be. So the photo with the text overlay is not the best relationship. Now, they could have done a couple things. They could have darkened this photo you know, using a CSS filter or in an image editor or something like that, or they could have just used a different photo. For instance, if this white text was over the top left corner where the shrimp and the rock are, it probably would have stood out a little bit better than being over the oyster. Okay, so I like the photo, I like the text, but maybe not exactly together. I like that they have this dark gray little smaller navigation off to the right. That's actually kind of nice. Find your local weather, pretty clear. Um, news tools about, that also seems pretty clear. However, it's a pretty small link. It's a pretty small font size. If it's a really critical feature of the website, finding your local weather sounds pretty important. Make it a nice big chunky button perhaps. What else have they got? That text looks pretty good. I like the, when you hover over it, I see that little dotted border. That's pretty nice. I like that effect. I like these three photos side by side. Uh, fisheries, which is kind of weird. The category is fisheries, yet the photo is of divers pulling debris from the northwestern Hawaiian islands. The photo doesn't seem to match up with the category of fisheries. I don't know anything about this stuff, but it just seems like a disconnect to me. So this is when you use stock photography, you know, good photographs, but it doesn't really convey a message. So photo is nice, but doesn't necessarily convey a message for what it's about. Research and climate, okay, that makes sense. We have a, a reservoir that's clearly the water is lower. That probably starts to fit in. And then we have education. Um, obviously someone doing some kind of a webinar or a video conference or something like that. So, all right. So two of these photos are pretty good. Maybe they could be better, but they're pretty good. Um, that one seems to have a disconnect. Uh, the footer down here is pretty nice. They've got that dark gray color, nice obvious feedback button in the lower right, um, nice secondary navigation, cool. So there's some features on this site that I really, really like, which means we can learn from it. We can say, you know what? I like the photo with the text on top, but I would choose a better photo. Or I like these three photos side by side, but again, I would choose photos that really fit with the purpose of those hyperlinks. So that's what I'm talking about. You go to websites and you find little aspects. This will probably be pretty neat, I bet. If you click on this, that expands out and does that. We won't do that in this class, um, but uh, definitely we'll do that in the 295 course. It, it's not tough, tough. It's a little tough. Um, 
it requires some skills that obviously we won't cover until like week seven and eight. And then it requires a couple skills that wouldn't even be part of the class. There's a little bit of JavaScript involved, but it is pretty cool. And it kind of deals with the issue that using icons alone for menus is not a good way to go. Having the text there would probably be better. Do they even need to hide it? I don't think so. Because why hide the text if the text is helpful? Okay, so... So uh, yeah, I do like seeing the text there um, for that navigation menu. It is the main navigation menu. So pretty neat. Next time you're at a website, and I'll try to do some kind of participation activity where you have to do this. You have to go out to some websites and find examples of features that you like and share those, like screen captures and stuff. But don't forget, you can find cool things on websites and then just, hey, Ralph, I'm looking over at this uh, website, noaa.gov. And um, I like how they do X. Is that something we're going to be covering in class? There we go. Just try it like that. So let's see. How's my page looking today? It is looking pretty, pretty rough. Pretty rough. It's very, very minimal. We spent an hour and a half easy on a web page that has that much HTML on it. <laughs> but that's okay. Our topic for today was CSS, and we did a lot with styles. We have a one style sheet, which is just controlling a reset rule and a few defaults like CSS variables. Then we have another CSS file, which is controlling quite a few things. I've got a couple generic type selectors controlling body and header. I've got a descendant selector controlling the divs within a header. And then I've got um, some big chunky rules here that are controlling individual elements by their ID. And I think I do have at least three rules now with at least three declarations. So that would be enough for participation 3A if that's what you're going for. Um, so I think I'm gonna leave you here. Don't forget participation 3A due tonight, just an example. It could be like the one we did here in class or it could be something different that you're doing. Um, I'm only looking for three clear and obvious parts where you're demonstrating CSS properties. Um, what we did today is more than sufficient. What are you gonna do to get it to me? You're gonna need to publish it and then you need to make a link on your index page that'll take me to your demos page. So whenever you upload a page, there's always that follow-up responsibility. You've got to update your index page hyperlinks so that other people can click on that link and go to your demo page. Cool. And then we've already got a head start on our Thursday participation. All right. I'm going to be, um, I don't have to head out until like three o'clock for an appointment. So I will be hanging around for a bit. Do you care if I uh, share my screen, my screen, do I troubleshoot something real quick with you? Um, you want to do it um, with the class or out or just after class? I don't mind. I just can't get my uh, my class to show up. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what? I am kind of curious. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and officially in class. I'm going to turn off my recorder somehow. 